And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, the frontman of Dojo Kun Comics, cre creators of si of the ch of Siamese, if you please. Sorry, couldn't resist. <laughs> which is which is currently which is currently in demand on Indiegogo in trade paperback form, co covering the first four issues in one in one combined um, kit and caboodle. Jeez, I probably just dated myself using that. The <laughs> one and only Brian, you gotta shop Menard. Hey, how are you tonight? Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you for having me on. Sorry if I came off a bit Minnesotan by using a Menards joke. <laughs> but well, you I am. You good money at Menards. <laughs> <laughs> I look. It look that you have you have no idea how you have no idea how ingrained that ca that catchphrase was was in my head with all the radio I was listening to growing up. <laughs> the first time I was ever in a Menards store and heard that jingle, it was kind of freaky. I have to admit, it was it's like wow, that's that's my name on the thing. That's odd. <laughs> I would be very I would, I would be very disappointed if if any time you've been in Minnesota, nobody's brought that up. <laughs> well, they've got them here in Michigan now too. So uh, I've I've tried to get a discount there. I show them my driver's license. They just roll their eyes at me. <laughs> Uh, to be fair, I get to be fair, I get the same I get the same response whenever I whenever I um whenever I ch whenever I check out and I ask, hey, you got two tens for a five? <laughs> and that joke's older than both of us. Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and although there's been a couple situation, there's been a couple instances where they actually did give me give me two tens. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh, one one case was at a Ren fair, and I I thought about giving it back, but then I realized if he's that unattentive, maybe he deserves this. His drawer's gonna come up short. <laughs> <laughs> well, then it's a case of not my problem. <laughs> uh, but I'd l I'd like to open with the humble beginnings. Um, how'd you first get introduced to um comics? Ah. When I was seven years old, we were on our way to Florida, and Mom was afraid to fly, so we would drive there. And we stopped at a 7-Eleven to get some snacks and all that, and there was, mm -hmm. of course, a comic book rack. Mm -hmm. And Dad came over and said, hey, why, why don't you pick out a couple so that, you know, kill some time on the drive. So the first two comics I ever bought were Amazing Spider-Man number 196 and M. Kenny X-Men number 126. Um, and that was roughly 47 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. I've basically been hooked ever since. Although in 1999, I quit cold turkey. I had two infants, and there just wasn't enough disposable income to continue the collection. Mm -hmm. So there was a hiatus of about 14 years, and then I just couldn't stand it anymore, and I got back into it. <laughs> now, when I got back into it in roughly 2014, things started going a little sideways with uh, people putting their agenda in comics. And I have mm -hmm. to admit that after just a few years... I stopped buying virtually all of the main, the big twos comic books, and now buy indie comics exclusively. I um, now I don't, I always end up asking this question to to pe to people when it comes to comics. But growing up, did you consider yourself more of a Marvel guy or a DC guy? Well, admittedly, I started out as more of a DC guy. Superman was the the big cheese to me. I, I really just thought he was. Uh, the best mm -hmm. um, but I'd have to say probably in my formative years like when I got into my late teens and 20s um, I became much more of a Marvel guy which given given that time frame is, is certainly understandable especially since um, around that time Marvel was actually making money as a uh, comic book whereas, oh, were... DC, whereas DC was only making money as an IP uh, I see what you're getting at. Yes. Uh, the DC that was really the top notch at that point was the New Teen Titans by Marv Wolfman and George Perez. Mm -hmm. um, but at that same time, 
Marvel was firing on all cylinders with the Uncanny X-Men, the Avengers, and a few others. So I think that they were doing far better at that point. Now, there, like I said, there were some really great things coming out of DC, but they were much fewer and further between. Yeah, and the big... That's that's why I, that's why I said that um, most of most of Marvel's most of um, DC's money around that time was at was um was as a was as a was as a I was as licensing out the IPs to to mer- to merchandise shows and shows and all that kind of jazz. Right, because that time by that time Superman had come out in the um, film. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you're right. Although. Um, when it comes when it comes to su- when it comes to Superman films, I'd be remiss if I didn't po- if I didn't point out the in- the insanity that was supposed to be um so- supposed to be the t- the Tim Burton Superman. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um. um, but to, to let you know, as far as how I got into comic book publishing, that sort of goes hand in hand and is a good segue. When I came back into collecting, I only chose three characters to collect. Uh, She-Hulk, Juggernaut, and DC's Superboy. And mm-hmm. at the time, Superboy was the black T-shirt with the red S and the jeans. Mm-hmm. And I really uh, found that to be an interesting character, not his outfit, but the character. Um, but also at that time, I was looking for an opportunity to write comic books. I'm not an artist. I'm mm-hmm. hashtag just a writer. And what I did was I scoured Marvel's website for how do I you know, submit this script I've written for She-Hulk. And I looked... I, I, it took a very long time, but I found a small little paragraph that explains what you do. As far as submitting uh, a script or art, you don't. What they tell you to do is go get published and we'll find you. Well, so I started looking for opportunities to use my script as an application, if you will. Mm-hmm. And I found mm-hmm. this website called ZWOL, Z-W-O-L, which is great for hooking up writers, artists, colorists, letterers, all of that. It's it's a, it's a free site, and you've got people of various levels of skill and experience, so, you know, they, they cost different, uh, you know, commission prices. And there was an ad in there that said, we need help, somebody to write our comics and help us with our accounting. Well, I'd been an accountant for like 16 years by that point, so I was like, wow, that's a very oddly specific request. So I sent them a resume showing them I was, I was a certified internal auditor, certified fraud examiner, certified anti-money laundering specialist. And oh, by the way, here's my script that I wrote for She-Hulk, but you know, you can apply it to any of your characters. They hired me within an hour uh, and I worked for that company. It was Affinity Storm Press, mm-hmm. very small mm-hmm. press company, um, for a couple of years. Uh, the, the owner was... Uh, he was in dire straits a few times, couldn't really put out the things he promised. So I left that company and went instead to another one called Red King Press. I had uh, met the owner of that company through Affinity, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. worked for him for a few years. Um, uh, to put it tactfully, we had a falling out and uh, I started my own company, Dojo Kun Comics. So I did work for two other companies before starting my own. Um and uh, since then, Dojo Kun Comics has published 12 individual comics. And as you mentioned at the beginning of the show, I've got a trade paper bag which collects the four issue miniseries called Siamese. It's in, now. There's a couple. There's a couple things I want to spiral off um, from that. First, um, obviously, go, obviously, going from the comfortable end of the big two into the indies is a bit is a bit of a daunting um task um do you recall do you recall the first do you recall the first comic that you bought that was an independent uh yes it was called miss mystic by uh pacific comics it was a neil adams Mm -hmm. ip um and uh Basically, the best way to put it is she was sort of like a Mother Earth kind of figure. Mm -hmm. And uh, he also created uh, a team called Earth Four, which was an homage, I think, to the Fantastic Four. Um, It wasn't a direct ripoff, but some people some people would, you know, make that connection. Um, It was on purpose and he paid homage to them. And, uh, you know, it was it was good. It it didn't have legs until later when Continuity Comics licensed the same characters. And I, I think that they had around 20 different issues of Ms. Mystic from Continuity Comics as well. 
Mm -hmm. Now, with with that with that in mind, um, obvious obviously, um, you had you had mentioned pre you had mentioned previously as well that um, one of th that one of the things you were working on was a, a that kind of kicked off this little adventure was a, was a She Hulk script. Um, yes. Now, <laughs> obvious obviously, I'm. I'm pretty sure we can't go into full detail about the about the intricacies of of that um of that script, but given given the characters that you mentioned, um, she um, she, the two that I, the two that I want to focus on specifically are um She Hulk and um Superboy. Okay. Um, what was it that drew you to those partic those two particular characters? I think what drew me to She Hulk was the fact that she didn't lament the fact that she was a superhero. She, you know, wasn't all angst ridden and mm -hmm. she enjoyed being She-Hulk. In fact, to the point where one time she was stuck as She-Hulk and Reed Richards tried to deliver that as if it was bad news. And she was like, okay, sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she loved being She-Hulk. She kept her intellect. She was super strong. She was independent. Um, and, you know, in some cases she was written as a, uh, the characterization that John Byrne gave her when she was in the Fantastic Four was very, very good. I think he treated her as the butt of a joke, though, when she became, when she had her own series that he wrote and drew. And all of the villains that she faced were the D level, if, if even that high. So he made her, uh, he, he, he was too enamored with his own cleverness, in my opinion, but back to she helped the character i think that uh part of what drew me to her too is the fact that she broke the fourth wall far earlier than deadpool ever did um she started in uh it was the early 90s maybe breaking the fourth wall and at the same time animal man did as well so they did literally the same month uh they both started breaking the fourth wall it wasn't until much later that deadpool came around and did the same. You could argue that Superman broke the fourth wall decades before any of them, when in his final panels of many of his issues, they would show him turning and winking at the reader because we were in on his secret. Mm -hmm. So he knew the reader was there back in the, maybe as early as the 60s. So there's that too. Now Superboy started out as a clone of of Superman, um, they've retconned his origin so many different times. I'm not even sure what they say he is now. But uh, when he first appeared, and he was in that leather jacket, he was kind of, you know, carefree and also loved being a superhero. Uh, didn't didn't uh, you know make any bones about wanting to get the chicks and all that. It, I like the characters that are written as if they're having fun while they're trying to do good. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's why I was drawn to those two. I I can I can I can certainly see that and when um I will I will note that um if you if you if you want to pick on anybody for doing for doing a lot of retconning when it comes to Sewer Boy um Jeff Johns is over there <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah I like Jeff Johns's work but um but um well we have we have a one we have many mantras here in the temple and one of those is um. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are cremated equal. <laughs> <laughs> nope, nobody's nobody's above getting roasted, and there have been plenty of things for me to pick on um, Jeff Johns over. Not going over the um, his time as his time as running the show for the film end of things. Um, he's very good. Johns is very good at writing a um, entertaining popcorn flick. One that one that one that's. It's a good it's a good ride. You just don't want to overthink some parts of it. But he also has a bad habit of um ret of retconception. I'll call it. <laughs> like, um, I'll use I'll use a more I'll use a more popular example, and I'm step I'm stepping on some toes, but um, Blackest Night. I liked Blackest Night as an event comic. Um, okay. Ki kind of. Kind of similar, but not quite to Marvel to Marvel Zombies in some in some ways. Um, but there's the, there's the whole thing that the re that the reason that this whole thing w came about is because the villain had per had al had allowed for a little crack in the do the door between life and death, so that heroes could keep getting revived. Um, 
even though even though that is retconning something he had said in his previous work about about that whole thing. So fair enough. <laughs> well, you know, because <laughs> comics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, like if I think I think that's one of, I think that's one of the appeals of um, of the indie end of things is the fact that you've got singular visions and thus you you um you don't necessarily have to have as much um ret- as much retconning. You can ca- you can kind of have a series bible that you can work that you can work around. Oh, this is true. Yes, uh, the Dojo Kun universe is a connected superhero universe, mm-hmm. so there will be things that are canon. That if it happens over in Siamese, for example, it will affect uh, Deanna Hammer of the Angels. It'll affect Trident's New Alliance. So I hear what you're saying, though. If if you want to change something, retconning may still be possible, but you've got. Uh, not just, or I'm sorry, instead of a whole bullpen of writers and artists and all that, you've got one person running the show most of the time. And in that case, it's their vision that you're trying to portray. So you're right. It would be easier to do that and keep control of it as far as continuity goes. Yeah. And culturally speaking, I'd say since the, I'm not, I'm not, I'll use, I'll ballpark and say since the, um, since the seventies. There's there's been a there's been a kind of romanticism of the of the soul creative um, vision or soul creative voice. Um, I use the 70s as, as an example to um, to differentiate, say, the um, pr- the the days of filmmaking before the movie Bratz versus the days afterwards. Okay. Um, if you look at if you look at the days before, especially with some of the bloated productions um, in the 60s. You, um, it was the producer who was the primary creative voice. Whereas after 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 the um, dawn of the movie brats, it was the um, director who was the primary creative voice, and the producer was that guy who had to be outwitted. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> um, Fair enough. And in this, I'd say in this, I'd say in the same vein, we ca- we kind of ha- there's there's that there's that kind of thing with um uh, with media outside of film, um. Whether whether it be, I already mentioned the whole thing of picking on Jeff Johns, even though he even though he was just one component of some of the retcon issues, um, but but he's but he's the face that's on, that's on the front of it. So you know how it is: the leader goes down with the ship. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Um, and it's be, but because but but I'd say I'd say something that helps that particular. Cult, that particular cultural appreciation for it for a soul voice is is the fact that you have a direct line. Um, you have, you don't have an idea that's being filtered through multiple people, <laughs> which true. I'd say I'd say the biggest case in point in comics regarding that, especially in um shared, especially in large shared universes, it company wide like that is um is the is the fact that, is the fiefdom issue, like. You've got a bunch of writers and editors for, say, Batman. You've got a bunch of writers and editors for Superman. You've got a bunch of writers and editors for Wonder Woman. And um, when when team when team ups are mandated, they don't always agree on how, on how the character should be portrayed. Right. Or or that's or that certain or that certain characters should be used. So let's say let's say you want to have a team up with with say um with say with say with say Supergirl and um. And um, Robin. Well, then, the, well, then the bat, well, then the Batman people might be like, "Hey, we're using Robin right now. You can't do that." And the, <laughs> then the, um, the Robin people might say, "You can't use that unless you bring up this event." <laughs> and, and then, and and then the Superman team is like, "We're we're using sh- we're using Supergirl for something else. You can't do you. We get we've got issues. You kind of see well, where this know- is going." To take that to its uh, logical extreme, when DC and Marvel finally put the Avengers and uh, the Justice League together with uh, Busiek and Perez, Mm -hmm. one of the issues I took with that is uh, there was a fight between Superman and Thor. Superman beat down Thor. And, you know, that, you know, whichever one's going to win depends on the writer. But then the Avengers piled on Superman and all attacked him at once. Now, of course, that's what it would take, I think, in my opinion, to beat Superman. But I don't think Hercules or She-Hulk would have partaken in that. And here's why. 
Not long before that, Hercules was nearly beat to death by the masters of evil in a in a gang and mass pylon with the wrecking crew and Mr. Hyde and uh, Power Man and uh, Absorbing Man. I think there was a whole bunch of them that beat him down, put him in a coma. Mm -hmm. And uh, largely the same thing happens to She-Hulk as well. So I don't think the two of them were properly written in that scene that they would pile on like that. I don't think they would be a part of it. So there is sometimes, you know, a, a bit of leeway given that shouldn't be, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Now, th now that brings that brings me to um, Siamese, and I'm sorry, but I I had to I had to use the I had to use the um, joke from from Lady and the Tramp. It's <laughs> yeah, I've heard that a couple times. <laughs> I f I fig I figured that's why that's why I decided I'm just gonna get this out of my system now because this is way too obvious of a joke even for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> um. But how did how did the idea for Siamese um, come about? What I wanted to do is I wanted to create a, a pair of characters. They ended up being twins in my book, but I wanted them to both sort of play off of one another. So that that's sort of how it became a natural natural extension that they were the twins that they have very similar powers, um, and what I did was I used that as a springboard for the whole superhero universe. Mm -hmm. So you, you first meet them. And uh, from that, the other superheroes are introduced. In fact, there's a total of seven superheroes introduced in that four issue miniseries, mm -hmm. which is collected in my current crowdfunding campaign. And there's a whole bevy of supervillains as well. So, and, and some of those supervillains don't yet even face the heroes. It's just, in some cases, a backstory that's being told, interwoven with the story that you're seeing develop with uh, Siamese and the friends that they make over time. So it's basically, honestly, the great jumping in point for the Dojo Kun universe. And that's why I collected this, these four issues as a trade paperback to, to get it started. This is my first crowdfunding campaign. Mm -hmm. But like I said earlier, not the first comic I published. So once this... Uh, trade paperback is done. Once I get that fulfilled and, and in the hands of the backers, I'm going to close the campaign and then start moving on the other IPs that I've written. I have uh, four issues of Deanna Hammer of the Angels that are written. They're not. They're not done yet. I've still got, uh, you know, the artist and colorist and letterer to work with, and I've also got a number of issues of Trident's New Alliance, which I mentioned a little while ago, and that's basically the team that is forming. Mm -hmm. It starts in Siamese further develops in Deanna Hammer of the Angels and then becomes a team. And that'll be an ongoing. I wish I could tell you it was monthly, but yeah, not likely. <laughs> it's going to be an ongoing series, though, of uh, a superhero team in my universe. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, I also have a license that I just recently got from uh, a, an award-winning novelist. She wrote a trilogy of novels, which are called the Healing Wars, and I would liken those if I was going, if I was asked, I would liken those to uh, like Divergent or The Hunger Games. So there's a lot of similarities there. Of course, she takes it in her own way, and um, the main character, the protagonist, is Naya, and her ability is a little different. Most of the people who are healers can take the pain from someone and shift it into this uh, enchanted metal. But Naya can't do that. She can't push it into metal. She can only push it into another person. And she has to stay on the run because there's an occupying nation that has taken over her country. And she doesn't want to be weaponized against her own people. Mm -hmm. So this that goes on for, uh, you know, three issues or sorry, three novels. And I've been licensed to do a graphic novel adaptation of that series. So I'm excited about that as well. I've got a lot of irons in the fire. But to bring it back to Siamese, um, with Siamese... The uh, the first 60 days are done. It's in demand now. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. are uh, still the regular cover and four variants are available. The hardcover sold out pretty quickly. There was a hardcover done by the Barton Brothers. But um, the there's some just fantastic artists who did the covers. The interior, I can tell you this about the artists on the interior. I had someone come in and do Siamese number one and two. He was a fine art portrait painter who I discovered in a nursing magazine. I was, yeah, yeah I'm, you're probably like, you know what? I was in a <laughs> hospital waiting room, waiting for someone close to me, having surgery, and just thumbing through whatever magazines were on the table. 
there's a nursing magazine. It's not breastfeeding. I mean, like nursing, like the, the RN LPN. Mm-hmm. And there was a, um, an ad in there for some program that they used to track patients' history. And it was done in like comic book form. And I thought, you know what, this artist is, he, he did this pretty well. I tried to look, you know, for his name. It wasn't there, but I did see the ad agency and I got in touch with them and asked to get in touch with the artist, which they found to be a little unusual, but they got me in touch with him and he agreed to do comic books with me. About halfway through it, like I said, issues one and two, he had to leave, but not on bad terms. He got a, a huge, and I mean huge, commission to do a portrait of somebody. So he stepped out and I found a Brazilian artist named Zilson Costa who uh, had created a few comics down in Brazil and he took on the reins for issues three and four. And although his art style is a little different, it's not so different as to be jarring when you go from one to the other. So um, I was fortunate to work with both of those guys. And you'll see if you get Siamese that they are uh, fantastic comic book artists in their own rights. Mm-hmm. Now, I've been kind, I've been kind of, I've been kind of dodging this, but, <laughs> but it, it's one, it's one of those, it's one of those things that is that. Um, it imme- immediately struck out to, struck out to me when I lo- when I look at um, Siamese. Um, just out of curiosity, was was um was was, was old style Catwoman a mi- a minor inspiration for the design? <laughs> it would be fair to say it's a bit more than minor. Uh, if you were to see the Catwoman uh, that Jim Balant did mm-hmm. uh, back in the, I guess that'd be the, maybe the late 80s, early 90s, mm-hmm. uh, that, that's definitely a style that was impressed upon me. I really did enjoy that series. Um, it, I think that in today's day and age, if you try to create something completely original in comics, somebody's going to find something somewhere in comic book history. I mean, they've been around since, what, the early 40s, 1940s, close to 100 years now. You're going to find something that maybe was inspirational. So uh, our Siamese, do they look a lot like Catwoman? Yeah, absolutely. There's no denying that. But what I've done is I've written their character as uh, different characters as far as their characterization, their interaction, their personalities. Um, And also, too, you know, there's two of them. So Mm -hmm. double the fun. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And personally, personally speaking, um, when I bring up that kind of thing, I don't, I don't do, I don't, a lot of people will do, will bring that kind of thing up and, and to, um, to use some sort of ripoff argument. I, I don't, I don't care for that because it's not, um, it's not stimulating. Um, but the re- the reason why I bring that kind of thing up is I believe, um, art is always a response to other art. Sure. Yeah. No, I didn't take offense at all. I, in fact, you know, several people have mentioned that some people take the tone of, ha ha, I gotcha. This is, you're ripping this idea off. Other people have been gracious about it. Like you were just now saying, you know, was that an influence? And you know, there, the answer is yes, it was absolutely an influence. I would never deny that. Um, you know, a little bit of black cat is in there from Marvel too, mm-hmm. if you want to be honest about it. So, um, and, uh, you know, but even if you look back far enough, Catwoman and Black Cat were inspired by Miss Fury from even further before that. So, you know, it, it's it's okay. It, you can call it an homage, and I'd be fine with that. Yeah. Um. And I th- and it's interesting that you bring up tho- that you bring up those two characters within this because earlier on you talked you talked about the appeal of char- of um of runs runs with She Hulk and Sewer Boy as um. Characters who were unabashedly having fun, having fun, um, being su- being superheroes. Absolutely, yep. And would it be fair of me to say that that's a, that that's a motif that you tried that you tried to carry on with Siamese? One hundred percent. Because in addition to the fact that I want them to enjoy doing what they're doing, and that sort of gives them a little bit more motivation, I'm also trying, and you know. It, the readers can be the judge. I'm trying to emulate writers like Marv Wolfman and Chris Claremont. And the reason I bring those two up is they are, in my opinion, the consummate team book writers. Um, They have, you know, they did New Teen Titans and the Uncanny X-Men, and both of those teams had internal conflicts. They had uh, developing respect for the leaders. They had 
um, the development of what was like a family atmosphere. So there are things that they did. And I think the one that was most important, to be honest with you, is internal conflict, because you're not going to get a group of people like that, whether they're super powered or not, together that they won't disagree on things. I think that that lended some realism in a very supernatural or super realistic world. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of what I'm trying to emulate. But you're absolutely right when you ask did I try to make? Did I try to write these to emulate the fun that Superboy and She-Hulk have? And absolutely, that makes it fun for me. And that's always something that I've always used as a tip for writers: write as if you're writing for you, and then you'll not only have fun doing it, but you'll do it well. Yeah. And um, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to building um, building te building teams, now. Growing up in the '90s, as I as I did, obvious, obviously, um, when obviously the, there were there were several there were several team um, hero sh hero shows for me for me to choose from, um, whether it, whether it be whether it be X Men, whether it be Fantastic Four, or whether it even be Power Rangers, um, mm -hmm. what are so, what would you say are some of the um, are some of the major pitfalls that you've that you've seen with other writers when it comes to writing a balanced um, team? Oh, yeah, that's a very good question. And, and the reason I say that is when you use the word balanced, I think in a lot of cases, they uh, if I saw a pitfall, it would be that they tried to make their teams too overpowered. And then what would happen is they didn't have the the kind of I'll call it staying power for writing what kind of threat could this team face given the fact that they're so very overpowered. When you've got John Jones, Superman, Shazam, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, when you've got a group like that, what kind of threat could they face? And okay, you could probably rattle off five or six that would be a, a good you know, test of their mettle, but you will soon run out of such threats or you'll just keep repeating the same kind of threat over and over and over again. So a good balance in a team has to be uh, maybe one or two super bruisers or tanks, if you will, and then some that are more on a street level, some that maybe have supernatural, so that you've got a nice mix of characters, and that's what I'm going for as well. Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting. It's interesting that you bring bring that kind of thing up, since some um, obviously, gr obviously, gro obviously, given given the time that I grew up, eventually, I I was I was privy to the um, the uh, animated Justice League series. And within and within when you had the rogues gallery set up of that, you usually had um, either villains, t either a group of villains teaming up, or you had specific threats that were only that were only tackled by a section of the team rather than all of it. Yes. So, for example, if if uh, Terax came to Earth to you know make us bow because Galactus is on the way. What good would you know Hawkeye do in that situation? He, I'm sorry, he's not going to face that threat. So you know that's where you send Thor, Iron Man, Wonder Man. But you still want to have a good mix. So what kind of threat would you then place in front of a team like the Avengers, where Hawkeye makes a difference, but Thor doesn't just end it before Hawkeye even gets there? You know what I mean? So the writing for a team that has such a disparate power level or power set is difficult and that i think is one of the pitfalls that writers uh struggle with as we've as we've been discussing this um something that ends up coming to mind is the kind of um party composition that w that one might use um in a role-playing game and i'm i'm curious if you think that it, if, if that would be a um not necessarily a template to follow but a template to con to consider um when built when doing that kind of team building that's fair, because when you set up a, a group in a role-playing game, uh, a lot of the folks want to make sure that all of your bases are covered. You do want a tank. You do want a healer. You want somebody who can pick the locks, so you want a rogue on the team. So just like with supers, if you're going to set up a good, balanced team, you want people with skill sets that complement one another. Like we were just saying, maybe you want a, a knight on the team, a paladin, uh, perhaps, but you also want a... Uh, a thief and a cleric and uh, a mage. So you, you want to make sure that you could cover all your bases. And even in that instance, though, they're all starting, hopefully, if you do this right, you're starting at a similar level. Mm -hmm. But some of those characters will advance 
more quickly than others. So you've got to be careful with that as well. Your, your fighter, for example, if it's a pretty baseline fighter, is going to advance in levels much faster than the mage, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in that, in, within, that, within that same regard, um, if, I, if I have to use a non-RPG example, I'd say... Um, I'd say I'd say getting I'd say getting the crew together for a, for a heist movie could is another template that can work around. I'd say and specifically in this regard, I'd say um, the uh, arguably the best remake of all time, um, Ocean's Eleven. I, I was I knew you were going to say that. That was a very good one. Yes, <laughs> but and you know another example is the Italian Job. Yeah. Um, in this, in the sense of you've got you've got a bunch of people who are who are skilled in a bunch of different things. You've got you've you've got your safe cracker. You've got your you've got your confidence man. You've got your guy working security. Um, you've got your you've got your guy who's get, who's going to be acting as the muscle. Um, right. If I need if I need a more um a more lo, a more low key example that is that isn't just one big job. I could probably bring up um. Did you ever watch Leverage when that was on? No, oh, no, I'm sorry, I didn't. Um, the whole, that that's kind, it's kind of going into it's kind of going into that same that same kind of built building a team together for a speci for a specific kind of job where everybody has to do everybody has to do a certain part. Mm -hmm. You've got one you've got one person who's essentially the cat burglar, one who's the one again who's the muscle, one who's the um, grifter. Um, in the in the typical sense, not in the confidence man kind of sense, um, not in the <laughs> not in the current parlance that that that, that term gets used, um, <laughs> right? <laughs> and w one person who is as the, as the show referred to it, tech support. <laughs> <laughs> um, but e but each... I mean, you could extend this analogy to uh, the world of sports. In fact, that's probably the first place that you could extend this analogy, and that you've got people. Who are the enforcer on your hockey team? They've got people who are the finesse man who can handle the puck like nobody's business. You've got people who are faster on their skates, so you want them to be their forwards. So, like you said, you've got specialists in uh, in your team building, and that's where you get the good balance. And speaking of speaking of that, it bring that brings up a something that can be used as a as a warning. Um, a lot of. A, one one particular misconception that a lot of people have when it comes to when it comes to sports is that if you just throw a bunch of money around, then you then you can win a championship. Um, there, are, if I'm pretty I'm pretty sh I'm pretty sure there's a certain guy in Wa in Washington who tried exactly that in the '90s and ended up being dead last. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and, yeah. Throwing throwing money around does not a team make. Or you have or you have the situation of. Of some of um somebody get somebody getting a um a top a top flight get a top flight generational guy and thinking okay okay we've got this guy he's the he's the best there is so we sh so we should be all we should be all set for getting gold right um doesn't work that way no it no what you end, what you end up having what you end up having is what is one guy trying to trying to be Atlas carrying a bunch of scrubs. <laughs> So, so you're talking specifically about Barry Sanders in Detroit? Is that is that what you're hearing? <laughs> I, could what you, hearing? I could use I could use Barry I could use um Barry I could use Barry Sanders in De in Detroit. I could I could use um I could I could use I could use um I could use Ken Holland when he tr when he tried to extend the legacy of the Red Wings, um I also known as the Evil Empire. <laughs> hey now. Um, <laughs> hey. hey it's um, <laughs> look, the, look, the, look. I'm, all I'm saying is these days, watch out for Tampa Bay. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> you, um, if I need to use an, if I need to use another a hockey example lately, um, Con Connor McDavid up, Connor McDavid up in uh, up in Edmonton. It's like they got they got him and and Milan Lucic and th and thinking, okay, we've got two elite guys. We should we that's all we need. <laughs> And that's and that's definitely not the case, right? Um, and in this in the same vein, when trying to build a um, say say a, a superhero team, you can't just you can't just have um, Superman and a bunch of scrubs, right? Uh, but you know, I'd say that an example of 
taking a bunch of scrubs and developing them would be Batman and the Outsiders, where Batman mm -hmm. is a consummate leader. He got a group of uh, ragtag sort of C-listers together, but it was through his leadership that they developed into a team. So um, sometimes the the right leader on a team can make all the difference. So mm -hmm. maybe they're not the best player on the hockey team, but with someone like Iserman, you can build a team behind them because their leadership is so strong. Mm -hmm. um, so with a superhero team, if we're getting back to comics, then yes, if, if there's somebody there who is the glue, and they may not be the most powerful or the most you know experienced, but if they're the glue, can lead the team, and they know how to play off the personalities of the team such that they approach each player or super with the right attitude, it makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that, the other thing that I couldn't help but notice when I was going over the um, a bit a bit of the details with Siamese is that there's there um, if, unless I'm misreading this, there's a bit of a um, a bit of the classic comedy duel of of the of the um, cra of essentially the crazy man and the straight man <laughs> to put it one way. <laughs> a little way. bit, yeah, a little bit. Uh, so Kiao. Yao is the older of the two. She is like, what, 10 minutes older? Because like I said, they're twins. Mm -hmm. But she's the more serious of the two, the more responsible. She feels like she's got to watch out for her little sister. The little sister is a little bit of a, a little bit more of a free spirit. She's the one who makes the jokes more often. Um, she's a little bit more promiscuous mm -hmm. and flirty. Um, so, yeah, I do try to, to make that distinction. And the youngest one is, her name is Ya Yao. And if you, uh, if you look up the meaning of both their first name and their surnames or family names, you'll see that they both have to do with grace and style and poise. Mm -hmm. And with, with it, it's to, when it comes to, when it comes to that sort of comedy duel, the, it's, um, it's very tempting for me to bring up Abbott and Costello. And that's largely because, um, that was that was my first introduction to that to that particular duo setup in its purest form. Okay. Like I, I didn't I didn't grow now obviously I didn't grow up with Abbott and Costello. I'm not that old, but um, <laughs> but I even even I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> that's why that's why I said the two tens for a five gag is older than both of us. <laughs> yes. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> um, but obvious obviously I had I had been I had been inundated with with some of their some of their movies and some of their some of their sketches through especially the sketch that is required viewing that it that being um who's on first oh absolutely <laughs> yeah that's a, that's the classic mm -hmm. in fact it in fact i think it's got i think it's got its own spot in the baseball hall of fame in cooperstown does it oh that's phenomenal i love that oh uh, <laughs> but i've d i've d i've there's been that there's been the whole fifty dollars and fifty two <laughs> the the um Sesquihanna hat company which um predates both of them that was an old that was a that was an old vaudeville gag that had been around for years oh okay <laughs> i remember that one vividly as well um slowly i turned <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> i do know that one yep and 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 like it's it's definitely is definitely something that it that can be a nice um a nice a nice bit of re a nice bit of research material because you're seeing that comedy duo set up in its most undiluted um state Agreed. Um, and the, w now, um, given the given the current state of um of of Marvel in general and the MCU in particular, there's one um there's one bit of, given the and I'm bringing this up because of the um fun factor that we've discussed, mm -hmm. but there's been one um one point of criticism that I've had and I've seen a lot of um I've seen a lot of comic and film critics have, and that is the um. Ex the excess of quippage, as I'll ah. call it. Um, yes, totally. I, I, I am. I think in the minority in that I really did not at all like Ragnarok. The Thor movie was. They tried so very hard to be funny. They tried far too hard to be funny, and it it became just farce. It became silly, and I didn't like that movie at all. So I'm with you. It's far too much quippage. I think, you know it. It takes you out of the film because it's, it doesn't it doesn't properly portray the seriousness that you're trying to portray with the threat that's coming. I'd when it comes to um, when it comes to when it comes to that kind of thing, I um 
I mainly blame I mainly blame Joss Whedon for this because this is a this is a bad habit that he's fallen more and more into now that he now that he doesn't have as much um as as much other people protecting him from this habit, which is th which is that he doesn't write characters with a unique voice. Ah. Um, and I look I remember I remember looking back at some at some of his old work with Buffy and Angel and s and seeing this thing to an extent, and I ended up having to think what. If this was if this was present back then, why didn't I ha why didn't I have a problem with it? Was it just was it just my age or was it something else? And I I then re I then realized what the problem may have been. Um there's cer there's there are certain there are certain writers and certain creative types who need other people to rein them in, to yank the leash. Okay. And I think by the time we Whedon was writing super was doing superhero movies because of his profile as I'm Joss Whedon. Um, nobody was nobody was willing to rein him in on his shit. Kind of the, kind of the same thing with um, Lucas. Ah, uh, um, uh, that's that's very possible. I think that he did a great job with uh, Firefly. Yeah. Um, and but but so each of those characters had a different voice. But I'm hearing you. Maybe the producers uh, helped out with that. I'd 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 say on some level it may have been the producers, some level it may have been the writers he had alongside him, and in some in something like Firefly, it may have been the actors themselves. I wouldn't be surprised if there were certain um certain moments that got that got vetoed, plus um the plus the tone of the tone of a um of a we, of a western um certainly right. lends itself to that kind of thing. Whereas, but I, I think you're right, though. Ron Glass probably was the one. If anybody vetoed something, Ron Glass is probably the one that did it first, because mm -hmm. <laughs> he was, of course, the biggest name on the show at that point. Yeah, and the and the fact that um, his Shepard is Shepard is the is one is one character who, if he's going if he's going to be doing any sort of quip, it's going to be in dry, almost British kind of humor. Yeah, I agree. Yep, uh, like the whole thing of I don't. I'd I'd say an early example of that is the whole thing of I w I was go I was going to bring you dinner if you'd prefer a lecture I've got I've got a few of those sin hellfire <laughs> right. one one even has brimstone um, <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> but the but no, when it comes and when it comes to Ragnarok the I'd say the issue I had was one the whole quibbage thing of br of bringing in a guy who had mostly done Bollywood movies. Um, which are which are completely nuts and mm -hmm. and wildly colorful. Which I, I li don't get me wrong. I like Bollywood movies, but um, time but time and place. And two, trying to mix up, uh, trying to mix um two stories at once, because it was trying to be both Ragnarok and Planet Hulk at the same time. Right. And having read Planet Hulk and its follow up, uh, World War Hulk. Um, that left a really bad taste in my mouth because those stories are not happy endings. True, right? Um. But, it, you know, not just the quippage, but they did a disservice to a number of the characters in Ragnarok, mm -hmm. notably Valkyrie and mm -hmm. Grandmaster. Uh, I, I'm a huge Jeff Goldblum fan. Please understand that. Mm -hmm. But I think what they did to Grandmaster was was well criminal I, it, they made him a bumbling buffoon uh maybe goldblum portrayed the script correctly but the writers did not portray the character correctly i mean at the end where he's oh i don't spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't seen it yet you can't spoil end, something that's already rotten okay <laughs> well said yeah so at the end when he's uh, faced with all of those folks who are sort of cornering him, he acts intimidated and afraid and, ooh, you know, hey, could we compromise? It's like, he's an elder of the universe. He could probably vaporize all of them. Why is he acting like he's afraid? I don't... <sighs> anyway. But yeah, the reason the reason why I bring, I bring up this lengthy lengthy um, diatribe on, the, on this kind of thing is... I, is I um I'm cu I'm curious I'm curious how I'm curious um, your take on maintaining um, humor where it's appropriate and so that it do so that it doesn't fall into that particular trap. Ah, well I'll be I'll do my best to be mindful of that. I think that in Siamese there are a couple of serious 
tone sections that uh, the quippage stops, uh, particularly in Siamese number four. Mm-hmm. I don't want to give any spoilers away, but yeah, things things don't go well for the gals in number four in particular. Things happen against their will, and it even causes internal conflict between the twins. So um, yeah, things do get serious before things get better. Mm-hmm. And with with that in, with that in, with that with that kind of thing in mind, um, get, given given the whole given the whole thing of um, tone, I'm get I'm guess I'm guessing that throughout you try and ma- you try and maintain a degree of consistency so that when um, when th- when things do go bad, it's not a case of oh it, oh it's going oh it's going it's going to get better pr- it's going to get better immediately quick, r- double quick or so- or something like that. Um, I'll be honest and say that I probably could have written a fifth issue to stretch that out a bit. Um, and I I wish I had done so, you know, because I think that there was some, um, probably more to be explored in what happens to the girls in number four. But having said that and having given it a lot of thought and having conversations like this one, I do plan to revisit that in another mini series with Siamese. Yeah. I can't say in the very near future, but I am already, uh, noodling on what I'm going to do to expand that part of what happened to them. And I don't mean it's going to be a flashback. I mean, it will be a return to that uh, situation that they have to face it again. Mm-hmm. And with now with that, with that kind of thing in mind, um, what would you say were some of the, were some of the major learning experiences you had with, um, Siamese, with um, writing Siamese since that, since Unless I'm mistaken, that was that was your fir- that was your first real entry in getting your feet wet with this kind of thing. Um, there was a couple of other team books I had written for those other two companies, but mm-hmm. you're right. This one was largely the first time I really took the reins on this kind of a thing with my own characters, and uh, learning experiences that I, I truly took to heart were when you're writing for an artist. If you're not the artist yourself, you have to take into consideration that you can't. You can't say that she gets up from her chair, walks across the room, picks up a candle and lights it. Uh, That is four to five different panels. That is not a single panel. So you've got to be you've got to be mindful of a character can do one thing. It's like a snapshot uh, in a panel. Um, Another thing is you've got to write no more than and this is sort of just a guideline, but no more than 20 words in a panel. If you do more than that for the letterer to put in there, it's going to obfuscate some of the art. It's going to be far too much. So I would say write your script and then edit the hell out of it because you will find that there are things that you've written that could certainly be said more concisely. But even further than that, you could you could say that those things could be said more conversationally. Um, you've got to keep in mind when people are talking, particularly if they already know each other, they are going to use uh, fewer words to convey their ideas to one another. Mm-hmm. And with the with that kind, with that kind of thing in mind, since I know I know that you have um for, you have further pro, you have further um, projects in in development. What's what sort of lessons are you pl- are you planning on lear- are you planning on applying to um to future projects in that regard? Well, it's not just those lessons that I've learned, but ones that I've seen other people learn. I'm trying to learn from them as well. And that is uh, dissertations don't belong in a comic book. If you can't portray uh, hundreds of words in a picture, then you're not you're not writing the script properly for the artist to to take. Um, and then also, I need to not rush things. So, I want to get to this part, you know, and, and but there's some development and some storytelling that has to happen before I get to that part. So I'm going to be very mindful of that. Uh, I need to make sure it gets there with the right kind of pacing. And then when I get there, don't even rush that scene, but take that one to its logical conclusion with mm-hmm. the right kind of pacing. Were there, were there, were there... Were there instances within within Siamese where you, where there was a night where there was a idea or or scene or shot that was burnt that was burning in your head that you were trying to get to? Yeah, and and 
also too, I was trying to write them within the constraints of 22 pages mm -hmm. because that was, you know, that's the thing with a floppy. But I think that also too, going forward, if it takes me 24 or 25, that's okay. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to skimp on it just to make sure I, you know, stop it after 22 pages. Um, because what will happen when you're trying to fit it in 22 pages, you'll find that on page 15, you're like, ah, I don't think I can wrap this in seven pages. So you've either got to cut some stuff out from earlier, which might seem make that seem rushed, or you've got to rush the last seven pages and then it just feels sloppy. So you've got to be very careful with pacing right from the very beginning and maybe even do uh, something that slows down a writer, but do some storyboarding, even if it's just stick figures, just so you got an idea of, you know, how fast is this going to happen? Can this even happen before they meet so-and-so? So you've got to really plan the whole thing out, then write it. Mm -hmm. Now, now with that, with that said, I know, I know you meant, you mentioned that, um, that Siamese is current is currently on the in demand end of things, and um, I do want to I do want to give my congrats on how well the uh, cr how well that crowdfund campaign went, especially since this was your um, first go at it. Thank you. Um, yeah, it funded in three days. <laughs> Damn. So, well, one of the things I can attribute that to is the help I received from some folks in the indie comic network. Mm -hmm. I was about to launch it. And uh, I was in the back room with them, and they said, whoa, 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 have you done your pre-launch sign-up page? And I said, no, I, I, I didn't do that. They said, oh, please, please take the time to do that. Get at least 100 email addresses to people from people who are at least somewhat interested. I said, well, how do I get them interested? And they said, you need to appear on as many YouTube programs as you can and pitch this book, even if it's just in your pre-launch sign-up phase, on Indiegogo, because you need to not only show them that the IP is an interesting one, but honestly, sounds kind of conceited. You want them to know that you are an interesting person and that your passion for this project comes through in how you describe it, what you're describing, and the fact that uh, they want to back you not just because they think maybe the idea is interesting, but because you are. Mm -hmm. So I went on, and you're going to think I'm exaggerating, but I went on 80 shows. Uh, I kept track of them on a spreadsheet, and I kept them in uh, in sort of a guide form. It's on my website. So if uh, if somebody scrolls down to that, you'll see all, all of the shows I went on and then a few more that have come out since then. But what that did was it got my name and the name Siamese out there such that when I did launch the, the, the uh, campaign, people already knew about it. Mm -hmm. And that's why on day one, I got to about 40% funded. And then a few days later, it funded. Um, now, it's been sort of a trickling thing since then. Uh, a couple of times, like when when the first 30 days ended, there was a little bit of a bump because I went on a couple of shows and said, yeah, you know, it's about to close. Um, I extended it in a second 30 days. And then when that one closed down, there was a bit of a bump as well. Now that it's been in, in demand, a few, th a few other things have happened, like the hardcover sold out. Uh, we've started meeting stretch goals, and that excites some people. Um, the stretch goals being uh, six by nine prints of the first four covers, mm -hmm. then uh, mm -hmm. a set of six by nine prints of all of the current trade paperback covers and all the variants. There was a challenge coin. There was a stretch goal. That one has been met. And there's an ash can, which is uh, it's canon in the Dojo Kun universe, but it introduces five more characters. So, uh, you know, and a lot of people love ash cans. So with the, with the stretch goals being met, uh, that also sort of uh, raised a little bit of interest and excitement in the project, and that's why I am where I am now as far as the funding goes. Uh, we're we're approaching nine thousand dollars. I'd love to get to nine thousand before I shut it down. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who might consider backing, know this: the printer has all the files. It took three months for the printer and I to get to where it needs to be. That was that was very nerve wracking on my part, very frustrating. But I think. They're finally, it's in production. I expect that I will have the books in hand by the end of next week. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that means fulfillment for those of you who back now is going to be pretty quick. Um, and uh, if I have to reprint, I, no problem. That's a good problem to have. But uh, as it stands right now, I did over order. So for those of you who want to back it now, you will get it fast. I, I gotcha. Now, with 
with that with that said, I would like to I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. <laughs> well, it was great to be here. I, I, I thought it was cool that you invited me. I appreciate your time as well. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to discuss more of, more of the do, the dojo the dojo kun um, sequential art universe, I need I need to slim that down. Um, <laughs> or or just to or just to um, just to talk just to talk about just to talk about the RPG end of things and why the and why the um, bard keeps dying. <laughs> because the bard deserves to. That's why. <laughs> there, that's a whole show in its own, on its own. <laughs> uh -huh. um, the door is always open, okay. as I often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. All right. Well, that's good because I have. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>